I went to a soccer game. Uh, it was Australia playing Bangladesh. It wasn't a very good game. Australia won by seven goals. But what was good was watching the flags in the crowd. The Bangladeshis were maybe unsurprisingly flying the Bangladeshi flag. It's a green flag with a red dot at its middle, slightly offset so it flies straight on a flagpole. The Australians, on the other hand, were flying all kinds of strange symbols. Despite flags being political symbols, this wasn't for political reasons. The Australian flag is one of only three internationally that doesn't feature any of its national colours. And the Union Jack in the corner makes it very easy to mistake for the flags of either the UK or New Zealand. So lots of other alternative symbols are used. One flag, however, caught my eye. It was a green and gold Eureka flag with the colours of the Aboriginal flag at its centre. What was so striking about this design was that it didn't just seem like another fun sporting symbol. It seemed like a genuine attempt at redesigning the Australian flag. Every few years, there's some controversy stemming from the current design. Whether that's progressives disavowing the design. Well, I think we've got a lot of work to do in this country to tell the truth. Or conservatives rallying behind it. In recent decades, it's become a favourite symbol of white nationalists. And after COVID, it's becoming much more common to see the flag flying upside down in protest. It's becoming less common to see the flag flying alone, without an Aboriginal flag flying next to it. Although there are not often direct calls for a new flag, I think there's clearly some dissatisfaction with the current design. So for this video, I wanted to look at 10 alternative Australian flags and see if any of them do a better job of being the Australian flag than the actual Australian flag. At the same time, I want to see if there's any lessons we can learn from each design. Despite its often wavering popularity, no one has been able to suggest a better alternative. So let's ask the question, what could replace the Australian flag? As I alluded to, it's becoming increasingly rare to see the Australian flag flying alone. Its design comes from 1902, a time before Aboriginal Australians were seen as people, and it has the flag of the very empire that colonised them on it. Flying it alone nowadays feels like it's missing something, almost. The design of the Union Jack is adaptable, and its meaning is flexible, but the design of the Union Jack on the Australian flag is not. The top left position is the canton, and that position is always reserved for a nation or empire that you are subservient toward. I think it often makes Australia seem like an insignificant British colony. Many then have suggested making a small but significant edit, replace the Union Jack with the Aboriginal flag. And although it's well-intentioned, this is a really bad idea. Why? Well, a flag is your country's international name tag. It's supposed to convey quickly your national identity. And this flag, rather than conveying a new national identity, highlights the division within Australia. It says that this side is for Aboriginal Australians and this side is for non-Aboriginal Australians. And it draws this nice little line for us in the middle. It's easy to assume that the Aboriginal flag is just a flag for one of the many ethnic groups within Australia. But Aboriginal Australia is ethnically and linguistically diverse. What binds them together is a shared political struggle for self-determination. As that political struggle is far from over, both flags would continue to be flown. And more than just looking ridiculous, I wonder if we could run the risk of having the meaning of the Aboriginal flag being diluted to become just another Australian symbol. The creator of the Aboriginal flag said this about the idea. Our flag is not a secondary thing. It stands on its own, not to be placed as an adjunct to any other thing. It shouldn't be treated that way. That's flag one and the lesson it teaches us. Don't take too much from the Aboriginal flag. Our next flag is the Triple Union. And although it's inspired by the merged design, I think it's so much worse. We learned from the flag's website that the three sections represent the custodians, Aboriginal people, the colonists, British settlers, and compatriots, immigrants. More than just being ugly, I find this slightly offensive. It's like taking a whitewashed version of history where these three groups all got along together, when the reality is so much more ugly and violent and complicated than this makes it out to be. Look, Australia is diverse and identity is complicated, and there's always this temptation to give each group its own little section of the flag. I'm reminded of the EU barcode flag, 
which took every member nation's flag and smooshed them into one. While trying to represent everybody, it resonated with no one. A new Australian flag should take inspiration from the real EU flag, where the number of stars has never even matched up with the number of member states. It represents the idea of a union, in the same way a new Australian flag should represent the idea of Australia, however metaphorical that is. And I think this flag teaches us an important lesson. Don't be too literal with your symbolism. For our third flag, we have an alternative Australian flag that's already internationally well-known and popular in Australia, the boxing kangaroo. You may think I'm joking, but I think it's important that we take these symbols that you see in stadiums and souvenir shops seriously. After all, so many of Australia's defining moments come from sport. Think Australia ending America's 132-year hold of America's Cup, where the boxing kangaroo was first unfurled. Think Stephen Bradbury winning Australia's first Winter Olympic gold in legendary fashion. Contact. Oh! All gone down. Bradbury is going to come through and win gold. Think Kathy Freeman draping both the Aboriginal and Australian flags over her when she won gold in 2000. And guess what third flag was flying in the stands? It was the boxing kangaroo. We love sport. We have four different versions of football. We have tennis and soccer and rugby and hockey. I don't think we actually need to use the boxing kangaroo specifically, but I think this fairly unserious flag teaches a very important lesson about color. The current flag is red, white, and blue, whereas the national colors are green and gold. You often hear green and gold being called the sporting colors, and that seems like a trivial distinction, but I think it's actually quite important. Despite having different national colors, Italy, Japan, and England all play soccer in blue. And no, since 1984, the national colors of Australia have been green and gold. It's used in a variety of contexts, but the association with sport is still pretty strong. I think it's a difficult jump for things to go from stadiums to the UN. When New Zealand was voting on a new flag, they didn't even include the popular black and white silver fern design because of its strong association with the All Blacks. There are plenty of people who actually like the current Australian flag and the Union Jack it contains. I think part of that is the way the Union Jack gives Australia a place in the world and a place in history. And that's needed as Australians are incredibly insecure about our national identity. I think it might even be what defines our national identity. We're a colonial nation founded by bread thieves and drunks. We're so insecure that we just need to know what other countries think about us. As one ABC article put it, Whenever a foreign celebrity touches down in an airport, they're swarmed by reporters asking, what do you think of Australia? What do you think of our sun and our beautiful beaches? You might know the essay on the cultural cringe where A.A. Phillips writes that, the Australian reader more or less consciously hedges and hesitates, asking himself, yes, but what would a cultivated Englishman think of this? Especially in politics where the flag has near universal acceptance, I think it functions a bit like the British monarch. It symbolically gives the institutions it represents a sense of authority and continuity. If we were to adopt a green and gold flag, it would mean standing alone internationally, and in some senses, coming of age as a country. So I think it's important that a new flag is green and gold. Well, then there's the fourth flag, the unity flag. I like this design. And one of the reasons I like it is because it ditches green and trades out the traditional Australian blue for a much brighter shade. So I'm going to amend what I said before and say that a new Australian flag should feature some combination of green, gold, blue or white. The fifth flag I want to show you is one that's popular on Reddit and not really anywhere else. The Golden Waddle addresses one of the issues with Australian symbols. Namely that we have so many to choose from. There is no one obvious Australian symbol like the Canadian maple leaf or New Zealand's silver fern. Our country is just so unique. Imagine if Canada had the platypus. It would be on the Canadian flag and every Canadian postcard. But instead they got stuck with this weird leaf. Because the platypus is native to Australia, it's just one of the many animals that are not found anywhere else. We are spoiled for choice when it comes to symbols. The solution then is the golden model flag. A design that invents an entirely new symbol. But it's really failed to gain any mainstream attention. And one of the criticisms I often hear is that it looks too corporate. 
but that's a bit of a weird criticism, especially when you consider the very logo-like flags of Switzerland or Macau. I think what's really happening here is the fact that the golden wattle was invented, and therefore Australians are completely unfamiliar with it. When they see it, they assume it must be a Centrelink rebrand. And then when foreigners see it, they are just completely lost because they don't even know what a wattle is. I think it's important that a new Australian flag uses a symbol that already exists and is already popular. This is especially pertinent in Australia because we have so many wonderful symbols like the kangaroo that are famous the world over. Like this time of year is when they mate. Whoa. Come here, bud. Here, we'll give him a move. We'll give him yeah, a that's move. a good idea. Yeah. There we On the other end of the spectrum, we have the Eureka flag. If you're an Australian, you might be having some kind of reaction to this flag, one way or the other. It was first used during the gold rush, during a miners' revolt. And because of that history, it's become a popular symbol with both left-wing trade unions and right-wing libertarians. It's definitely an attractive symbol, but I wonder if it just has too much political baggage to become the flag of Australia. The seventh flag I have to show you is Group C Canadian flag finalist. Wait, this isn't an Australian flag. How did this get in here? Uh, I included this one because it's just so weird and I really wanted to talk about it. It was one of the suggested entries in the bitter Canadian flag debate of 1964 and 1965. It looks pretty similar to the actual Canadian flag, except for the inclusion of a Union Jack and a Fleur de Lis. This flag is weird, but it makes a bit more sense when you learn that Canada is divided, both politically and linguistically, into English-speaking Canada and French-speaking Quebec. For many years, this was the flag of Canada. What made the flag debate so bitter was the belief by some English Canadians that removing the Union Jack would be disregarding Canada's heritage and giving an undue prominence to French Canadians. Rather than a neutral flag that represented no one's heritage directly, they wanted a flag that honoured both the founding races of Canada, which of course excluded Aboriginal Canadians. This was 1964 after all. Eventually though, as you might have guessed, the current Canadian flag won out. I think what makes this such an interesting case study is the fact that the Canadian flag is so popular today. Canadians have joined Americans in their slightly disturbing love of their national flag. And maybe they should because if you were to rank all the world flags, the Canadian flag would easily be S tier. Any of those criticisms and anxieties from 1965 seem almost funny after the fact. Are we, as Canadians, to have a flag which treats our memories, our past sacrifices, all the milestones of greatness as irrelevancies? Do not tear down in this nation the whole history of our past. The Canadian flag and Canada itself has managed to survive through two gruelling referendums into Quebec independence. I wonder how much the flag, a neutral symbol that picked no favourites, had in keeping Canada together. After all, the 1995 referendum was only decided by 1% of the vote. The main voice behind a new flag, Lester B. Pearson, said that he wanted something around which all Canadians, new and old, native-born and naturalised, of all racial stocks, can rally and which will be the focus of their loyalty to Canada. As one commentator put it, while there was a responsibility toward the past, the responsibility to the future was larger. I think for Australia, the lesson is clear. Create a strong design, and not one that feels a need to pay homage to the current flag. A flag that really suffers from this is the Southern Horizons flag. It's a flag that's won surveys, nominating it as a serious contender for a new national flag. It is very similar to the current flag, with a seven-pointed star on one side and the Southern Cross on the other, but now it's got this organic green stripe running along the bottom. It's clearly a competent design, and I think it looks good. My issue with it is slightly nuanced. The flag doesn't feel timeless. The swoosh as a graphic design element peaked in relevance about 20 years ago. But I think there's a bigger issue than just the style. Whereas brands get to redo their logo every decade, it's exceedingly rare that a national flag changes. It needs to be timeless. But the unfortunate reality is, the only way something becomes timeless is with time. Otherwise, you need to fake it with a design language that feels timeless. Things like coats of arms, tricolors, crosses, 
Rampant lions. It's difficult to transfer this to a continent it was never designed for. As an example, the emu on the coat of arms originally had one leg standing up, which is something you'll never see in the wild. But in 1908, when it was designed, people thought it looked strange without it. They were trying to force European ideas onto Australian animals. As one member of parliament said at the time, the emu and kangaroo are so built that they hardly fit into the heraldic atmosphere. I think we make ourselves ridiculous when we endeavour to carry on the traditions of the old world with some of the wild creations of our Australian fauna. Those traditional European symbols of lions and dragons feel much older than kangaroos and emus. To me, that's the near impossible challenge of designing a new Australian flag. Create something that is both timeless and Australian. It's why I think nothing as obvious as a Canadian maple leaf has come along to replace it. My issue with the Southern Horizon flag is the fact that it places us so heavily in this current moment, this awkward teenage phase Australia is going through, where we feel the need to edit and discuss our national symbols, whether that's the debate around Australia Day or the monarch or the national anthem. A new flag shouldn't compromise between the old and the new. There's a quote from the Canadian flag debate that I find illuminating here. We would be merely giving ourselves a perpetual reminder of the things that divide us. It would be preferable to have a distinctive flag that says just one thing, Canada. Not French Canada, not English Canada, not ethnic Canada, but Canada. The great and everlasting national flags have this kind of inextricable quality to them. And I cannot deny that as the flag that has represented Australia for so long, that it has some of these qualities. It's easy to make the assumption that a new flag will be love at first sight. Like you'd look through all the submitted designs and see that perfect diamond in the rough. But it takes time for a flag to grow on you. Even the current Australian flag was not popular right away. When it was unveiled in 1902, the Melbourne newspaper The Bulletin said it was a stale rachafe of the British flag. With no artistic virtue, no national significance, minds move slowly, and Australia is still Britain's little boy. That bastard flag is a true symbol of the bastard state of Australian opinion. Here's the thing, those loyal to Britain flew the Union Jack, and those with a more Republican bent flew the red version of the flag, known as the Red Ensign. To this day, you can see the flag in war memorials and RSLs, as it was the flag that Australia used during both the world wars. It wasn't until 1954 that the Blue Ensign was made the official and importantly exclusive national flag of Australia. Public sentiment had shifted, and Australia was beginning to view itself as an independent nation, and not just another British dominion. Australia is once again changing, and yet nothing has replaced the current design. In researching this video, I actually managed to find out what the flag I saw at that soccer game was. The Great Southern Flag. Actually a, a slightly older variant of it. It turns out this one guy in Queensland has been tinkering away at the design for the last few decades including adding the Aboriginal colours. He said that after watching Kathy Freeman in 2000, he realised that Aboriginal people deserved a spot on the flag as well. Look, I don't want to beat up too much on this one guy, but the flag is ugly. But there's a lesson here in just going out and making a design. If you have mixed feelings about the flag, what you can do right now is go into Photoshop, go make one, go get it printed out and start flying it. In a 2015 survey, 64% of those polled said they wanted a new flag and many didn't even care about the design, just wanting a flag that didn't feature a Union Jack. The current obstacle for a new flag is not a lack of desire, but a lack of good options. I do not think the Great Southern Flag is a good replacement for the Australian flag, but it is one of the only alternative Australian flags you can go out and buy right now. The best time to make a flag was 50 years ago. The second best time is today. Confucius. Maybe one day, if enough people like your design... Oh, I'm gonna... Maybe one day, if enough people like your design, it'll become the new flag of Australia. Oh my fucking god.